Let's start from the very beginning. Upon starting Dark Souls, well, you start with the start, the beginning of time essentially, a world where there is only one race of beings known as the arch dragons and a whole lot of weird looking trees and nothing else going on. Then underneath it all a bunch of humanoids find fire and some of these people take the lord souls and become lords of a soon to come revolution. Gwyn takes the first most prominent soul becoming the Lord of Sunlight with lightning powers, the Witch of Isolith takes one and that gives her the power of fire sorcery, Nito takes one and becomes the first of the undead with miasma powers, and finally the furtive pygmy takes one and well, we don't know for sure what it does for them right now but we know that it's somehow linked to humanity and the origins of hollows. Gwyn buddies up with the others and uses the power of lightning, fire and miasma, an army of lesser beings known as the Silver Knight and recruits an albino arch dragon called Seath to betray his own kin at a chance at developing immortality that unlike the arch dragons he lacked. They fight, they win and so ends the Age of Ancients. Gwyn establishes the Age of Fire and gives positions of power to all his mates and has a bunch of kids. His unnamed firstborn exiled under mysterious conditions, Guinevere the Queen of Sunlight, Gwendolyn the third son who is gender ambiguous opting to present feminine due to their affinity to the moon. Some people were even given a part of his own soul as a reward for fighting alongside him and maintaining his order alongside his children. There are only two known recipients of these souls and they were Seath and the Four Kings of New Londo. Seath creates an academy type place and creates sorcery as a byproduct of his research into becoming immortal and the Four Kings rule New Londo with their newfound power. The world is happy, the lesser beings live within the confines of Gwyn's new age and everything is fine. Until it isn't. The first ounce of trouble brews when Seath starts doing unethical experiments that get him shunned by some of Gwyn's most trusted knights such as Duke Havel. Havel has his mates forge occult weapons to fuck up any gods that come in between him and Seath which eventually leads Gwyn to trapping him under a tower quelling the rebellion. To make matters worse, something is happening to the Four Kings and they begin conspiring against Gwyn with the force of life drain taught to them by a serpent named Karth. We'll get back to Karth. Fearing this too, Gwyn drowns New Londo becoming responsible for the death of thousands if not millions of people and seemingly disposes of the traitors. But we all know bad things happen in threes as suddenly it appears that the fiery souls the lords all possessed start to dwindle and Gwyn panics that his age is ending. Gwyn tasks the Witch of Isolith to use fire sorcery to reignite the first flame but it ends up being a crude mockery of the first flame and causes a whole load of craziness creating demons and mutating herself and her followers including her daughters. The demons only accelerate Gwyn's loss of power and causes most of his silver knights to get killed. None of Gwyn's actions so far have really helped at all so as a last ditch attempt Gwyn literally burns himself, his own soul, to rekindle the presence of the first flame. Without realising the perversion of the course of nature causes humanity to be plagued by a curse aka the hollowing. People are essentially turning into mindless zombies. The longer Gwyn burns up as a source of the first flame, the weaker the flame gets and the closer humanity goes to hollowing up. So the agents of the first flame create a prophecy which is essentially a grooming programme for humans to usurp the powers of all the Lord Souls and become fuel for the first flame much like Gwyn has already. And then comes us, locked in a cell in a place where all hollows go to be forgotten. We're eventually saved by a bloke who regurgitates the same prophecy and asks us to ring some bells in order to take Gwyn's place. So that's exactly what we do. We kill a big demon guard and leave the prison, fight off a bunch of hollows, demons and other creatures until we ring all the bells and open a pathway to the land of the Lords, a very sunny fortified kingdom called Anolondo. We go off and fight more things including a certain fable duo and reach a very nice chest. This very nice chest gives us a big bowl called the Lord Vessel. If you want you can go even deeper into Analondo and find out its sunny complexion is an illusion created by one of his living children Gwendolyn, further reiterating the point that the world is going dark. Now from this point we can go one of two ways, we either speak to Frampt, a serpent who reiterates Gwyn's prophecy and encourages us to become kindling for the first flame, or we meet Karth who tells us to use the Lord Vessel to kill Gwyn and refuse to allow for the flame to be reignited and begin an era where the Hollows are in charge. Either way we still have a bunch of Lords to kill, we kill Seath in his library Academy University place to find out he was never truly able to become immortal. We kill Nito, who sort of is just chilling underground. We kill the Witch of Isolith, who's found deep in the consequences of her actions, and we kill the four kings in the now destroyed New Londo. 
As for the soul of the furtive pygmy, although not necessary for an audience with Gwyn, we can find something at least slightly linked to it. If we take the optional route of the DLC, we can go back into the past and learn more about what happened at the precipice of everything going wrong. We land in a place that was at the source of the abyss that we are told is linked closely to the darkening of the world. With the intention of helping a woman who's been captured by said abyss, we end up in a place with floating humanity sprites and eventually face to face with Manus, who is the so-called father of the abyss. At this point, the nature of Manus is hard to gauge. It's likely that he is the furtive pygmy, a concept we'll go further into into the next game. Regardless, with all the lords dead, all that remains is our audience with the big man, Gwyn. With all the lord souls in tow, we enter the kiln of the first flame and face off against Gwyn, except he's barely the man of the tales. He's going hollow. His flame has clearly dwindled. With some effort, we can kill him. Now you have two choices, kindle the flame or leave. Regardless of what you do, because of Gwyn's actions, the world is in a cycle and eventually someone does rekindle that said flame and that's where we end the first game and then we get into Dark Souls 2. Regardless of what anyone says, Dark Souls 2 is canon. Its events have weight in the overall story and its existence influences much of what happens in the rest of the series. In Dark Souls 2, we are what seems a few generations from the first installment of the game. It's unclear how many cycles we've gone through at this point, but it doesn't matter because we arrive in one of many kingdoms that exist during a cycle with a story that's mostly disconnected from the grand narrative of the series. Drang Lake is a place not too dissimilar to the setting of Dark Souls 1. In the Way that they're both dealing with the impending fate of hollowing caused by Gwyn's perversion of the course of nature. The narrative history of Drang Lake begins with a man named Vendrick. Much like the chosen undead of the first installment, Vendrick slays all four bearers of the Lord's souls and builds Drang Lake on the back of their souls. Eventually, Vendrick would fall in love with Nashandra, a woman of unknown origin who would win over the heart of the king and warn him of a land of giants and the threat they pose to the future of Drang Lake. Vendrick takes this knowledge, goes to the land of the giants, beats them and takes something from them. With the help of his brother, Aldia, this something allows them to create golems. These golems help him build Drang Lake castle further solidifying Drang Lake as one of the great kingdoms of the land. Everything is fine until it isn't. Just like the first game, bad things come. As eventually the giants seek revenge and after a few attempts at revenge the giants are finally defeated and the king is brought to their knees by an unnamed hero. But the giants ruined a large portion of the country by this point bringing many sites to ruin. And just like the first game the curse of hollowing is now also returning. Nashandra advises Vendrick to take Gwyn's old mantle and ascend the throne of want which is essentially a place where he can make the choice of either continuing the age of fire by burning himself up or allow for the age of dark. Nashandra herself is a fragment of Manus and therefore seeks power through Vendrick's soul so that she can puppeteer him into doing what she wants, essentially giving her the power of the throne. Vendrick eventually sees through her plan, flees the capital and hides away, tasking Aldia to find another solution to curing the curse that doesn't give Nashandra the power she desires. Aldia, looking back at the old arch dragons, wants to fuse their essence with humans to create something that transcends the confines of the curse, as the arch dragons didn't exist within that framework. Aldia does a bunch of failed experiments and eventually creates two notable creations, Shanalot and the Ancient Dragon, both hybrids, one of human and dragon and one of giant and dragon. Both essentially ineffective in staving off the curse, as although both beings repelled the curse, it did nothing to help stave off the entirety of the curse on humanity. In the meantime, Vendrick becomes hollow in the crypt, surrounded by a race of beings that keep the hollows at a stage of dark peace. Now, all that is left for us is to take the throne of want for ourselves in the place of Vendrick. However, there is another route we can take. If we go through the DLCs, we can travel to various different lands. We venture through each of these lands and find three kings with three queens. All three kings shared stories similar to Vendrick and all three queens shared stories similar to Nashandra. Much like Nashandra, all three queens are fragments of Manus that shared the longing for strength through their kings, except one of these queens became more committed to her king and instead chose to help her king with staving off the chaos that is threatening their kingdom. Regardless, we kill them all, get their crowns, and we learn that the existence of each crown can be fused to create an ultimate crown that allows us to transcend the curse, but only for oneself. There is no real cure to this curse. The story of Dark Souls 2 is that regardless of what level of interference we have, the undead curse is here to stay. So we go on to the throne of want, slay Nashandra and Aldi and we get two choices. We either take the throne and gain the power to control the future or reject it and wander the earth in a place of limbo, likely to allow another to take the throne of one in due time and restart the cycle altogether. Thus begins the story of Dark Souls 3. In Dark Souls 3, we return to a place much more reminiscent of the first installment. What is clear is that Dark Souls 3 takes place much long after the events of the first two games because the world has clearly seen so many cycles that it's literally turning into ash. 
Before we land in Dark Souls 3, a few notable things have happened. We know of four notable lords who have already linked the flame. Yorm the Giant, Ludlith of Corland, the Abyss Watchers and Aldrich. The Abyss Watchers are a group of warriors that have taken Artorius' mantle and used their power to stop the Abyss in the form of King Walnir. They succeed and then they use their combined might to link the flames together. And then comes Yorm. He's a giant that's initially tasked to look over the profaned capital and reluctantly and selflessly agrees to do so. And eventually he even agrees to link the fire after fearing the rise of the profaned flame he looked over that was very similar to the original Chaos Flame of Isolith. Yorm chose to link the flame, he does, but also kills many of his citizens. And then comes Aldrich. Aldrich was a saint of the Church of the Deep that tried to materialise a more peaceful alternative to the Age of Fire. Aldrich would eventually go on to devour a bunch of people and become bloated with power and souls and is eventually forced to link the flame with his new power. He does, it works. And then finally comes Ludlith, a pygmy lord who chooses to link the flame and does so better than most people but equally suffers the most too. His reign is awesome, lots of kingdoms are built, it's great. The next chosen to link the flame is Lothric. Lothric is born very frail despite his father Osiris attempting to groom his heir to become the Lord of Cinder. Lothric eventually fuses with his much stronger brother and they become one, now able to link the fire. However, Pontiff Sullivan, a scholar that aligned himself with the Church of the Deep, convinces Lothric to let the fire fade. They listen and neither Lothric nor his brother want to sacrifice themselves to link the first flame. Eventually a judge from a distant land comes to Lothric to link the first flame. He is already too late though, with no firekeepers to aid him he cannot carry on. Eventually he takes a cold sword used to create a bonfire and sticks it within him until someone strong enough can take on his task at a later date. Now while the world is left in limbo and through an unnamed occurrence a bell is struck and the preceding four lords of cinders are rebirthed. Neither of them want to link the fire so in a final act the bell is told again and the humans who have previously failed to link the first flame are born. They're called Ashen Ones. That's us. We're tasked with killing all four rebirthed lords, kill Lothric and use the immensity of their souls to combine and link the first flame. Sound familiar? Yes it should because we are once again back in a cycle. We find the Judge Gundir take his coiled sword and are shepherded by a firekeeper that resides within Firelink Shrine. The main route of the game has us fulfil the original prophecy, take down all four Lords of Cinder, Lothric and other obstacles and eventually defeat the Soul of Cinder that protects the First Flame, linking it once again to rebirth the temporarily stagnated cycle. Another route has us instead asking our firekeeper to mull the flame, but it's clear we've just temporarily staved off the cycle once again. Another route has us instead killing the firekeeper before she mulls the flame, instead leading to an age of unkindling, which essentially promotes the same future, except you're just a monster now. There is another route however, this route has us instead taking heed of a certain primordial serpent. Yes, Karth is back and we can go through a series of intermingling with his followers, a weird wedding ritual and eventually a chance at usurping the flame and bringing about the Age of Hollows, where you lead a world of hollowed humans to a seemingly better future. If none of these endings feel like a true end, thankfully we are also given a DLC ending which is canonically the end of the entire series and perhaps the world of Dark Souls. In both DLCs we are tasked with following a lowly slave knight named Gale. Gale initially asks us to rescue an alternative universe from a curse of rot by using fire that is inherent to our being. We do so and burn this alternative universe called the Painted World of Ariandel. Through our travels we essentially learn more about the nature of our own world in parallel. It's a great metaphor. We also learn of the existence of a painter who is attempting to paint a new world where we can all escape from all forms of the cycle and live in quiet peace. Gale wants this too and tasks himself with finding a worthy pigment for the painter's painting. In the second DLC, Gale once again transports us into a new place, much further into the future named the Ring City. It's essentially a place so far in the future that time has collapsed on itself. In this place we learn a few very important things. We learn that Gwyn was very aware of the existence of humanity even before the Age of Fire, and humanity would help him take down the dragons in the form of Ringed Knights, a very primal form of man that was subjects of the Furtive Pygmy. These ring knights help kill the arch dragons but Gwyn was scared of their dark soul and instead of lording them after the war he gave them the dark sign, a seal to their humanity in order to keep them from eventually rising up against him. This sign both imprisoned the humans and is the source of hollowing for humanity and it's exactly why when the fire fades so does the dark sign and therefore we become hollow. Hollowing is therefore the natural form of man. 
After a series of insightful discoveries, a bit of nostalgia and an egg, we are transported to the end of the world where only two remain, you and Gale. Gale has now consumed every ounce of souls in this world and wants yours too. We kill him, take his soul and find out his actions have allowed him to create a soul of worthy pigment to create a new world. This soul is thusly called the Dark Soul, containing all of humanity and notably all of the pygmy souls. We can go ahead and give the painter this pigment and this helps her eventually create a new world. A world void of the sins of this one and one that is therefore untainted by its cycle thus ending the cycle altogether and ending the soul series